Um, so yeah, thanks for having me here. So yeah, I'll present this uh, recent advance in zero knowledge, zero knowledge proofs, uh, like in the quantum setting, and this is based on two joint works, one with Williams Loftroy and Henry Wen, uh, and the second one with Anne Bradman. And since the main topic of this of, of this talk is in the intersection of these three very different uh, fields, I want to start uh, like gently and defining properly every every uh, uh, every building block that you need from each of them. So let me start by re uh, recalling what interactive proof systems are. So in complexity theory, one of the main uh, objects is the complexity class MP. And this is the set of uh, problems uh, for which we have a proof system where a polynomial, polynomially bounded verifier wants to decide if, uh, if uh, we have a true statement or a false statement. And this verifier receives the help of some untrusted prover. And this prover is unbounded. And we say that this problem is in NP. If there exists some proof that makes the verifier accept if the true statement is true, and for all false statements, no matter what the prover sends, the verifier should reject. And then we can uh, ask ourselves why limiting one-way communication? And then people have defined more, uh, have extended this model to define interactive real systems, where now the verifier that's still bounded can, can now ask questions or even challenge the prover. And then they keep sending questions back and forth. And again, we want that uh, this interactive protocol makes the verifier accept, that, that there is some strategy for the prover that makes this verifier accept for true statements. And again, for no statement, no matter what the prover does, we cannot convince the verifier false statements. And uh, we can uh, ask again, why should we limit ourselves with one prover? And then people have considered more, uh, more extended models. And for instance, we have, multi-proof interactive proof systems, where now uh, you can see this is a game, and in an offline, uh, in an offline phase, these provers, they, they share some classical strategy. And when the game starts, the verifier is able to communicate with both of them, but they, they don't communicate anymore. So they, they're not allowed to exchange messages when the game starts. And uh, uh, as, as before, we went for true statements. There is a strategy, a common strategy for the provers that convince the verifier. But for no, for no instance, no matter what the strat classical strategy that they share, they should not convince the verifier. Sorry? Uh, with high probability. No, no. The, uh, no yeah, yeah. They, they, know the, they know the instance, and after that, they, 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 they could even, like, since they are bounded, they can, they can coordinate for every possible instance. So it, it doesn't change anything, right? They, are, they can have exponentially many memory and resources. And it has been shown that actually uh, each of these uh, extensions uh, should be more powerful than, than the simpler ones. So for instance, it has been shown that uh, single proof of interactive systems can actually solve any problem that can be solved in polynomial space. And that the uh, multi-proof interactive proof systems, like they actually can solve any problem that can be solved in non-deterministic exponential time. And this has led to a lot of advances in complexity theory and, and cryptography. But in particular to cryptography, we are also interested in a, an, uh, another property that's called zero knowledge. And in zero knowledge, what we want is that the the verifier, after interacting with this prover, learns nothing from this interaction. So the everything that the verifier learned from this could, ha could have been computed by, by herself. And uh, the, uh, this is a very non-intuitive, counterintuitive. So let me, uh, let me tell a bit how, how we formalize this notion. So first, in this protocol, we want to be sound against uh, we want to prevent the verifier to learn more things. So we can be even more paranoid and say that the verifier can be arbitrarily malicious and interacting with the prover, she tries to extract as much as information as she can. And at the end of the protocol, she has some output and the output uh, could have some probability distribution here, here denoted by this random variable x. And for zero knowledge, 
like by, by for defining this notion of not learning anything, we, we require that there, there, exists, there exists some simulator that might depend on this verifier. And the simulator uh, runs in polynomial time and does not interact with the prover, and, the, and it has some output with some uh, that has some probability distribution, and here denoted by this random variable y. And we say that this uh, this protocol is zero knowledge if the probability this, this probability uh, these random variables are indistinguishable. And what do I mean by that? We say that this uh, we, we can define these in different levels. So we say that the protocol is perfect zero knowledge these two random variables have exactly the same probability distribution. Or th this, is, this might be too strict, so we can even be uh, less restrictive and, and, and ask that these two distributions are statistically close. And this gives us the definition of statistical zero knowledge. Or you can be even, uh, even less restrictive and, and, and only uh, consider uh, probability distributions that are not efficiently distinguishable. So what do I mean by that? That uh, the protocol is computational zero knowledge. If for every polynomial time algorithm, this algorithm cannot distinguish if it receives some, some sample from the first distribution or the second distribution. And OK, this is very uh, abstract. So I'll, I'll try to, to give an example, like uh, to try to have the definition by example, and maybe things will get more clear. So let's say that the verifier wants to find out if this graph is three colorable. And it means that uh, can I give, uh, can I paint each of, these, uh, each of these vertices in a way that for every edge, two endpoints do not have the same color. And a very simple way of doing this is asking the prover for a coloring. So the prover can, can brute force search for such a coloring. And for instance, the prover could send this, this, this uh, color into the verifier, and then the verifier can check if for each edge, the two colors are different. It's not hard to see that the prover can convince that the graph is three coloring for every case that it is possible. This is sound, because if the graph is not three colorable, no matter which coloring the prover gives, the verifier will find some edge that, that contains uh, the, whose, whose endpoints are monochromatic. But it's far from being zero knowledge, because the verifier has learned this this coloring that should be be hard to to to, to find uh, that she could not find by herself, right? So for that we can can different uh, have a different uh, protocol that is actually zero knowledge. So let's start let's start with the same setting. So the prover has this coloring for this for this graph, but just for starting the prover just permutes the colors. Okay, so we'll add some randomness on the on, 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 on this coloring. And the prover what uh, put these colors on some safes. So he puts in some safes and keep the secret and send the safes to the verifier, but keeps the keep the secrets, keep the, the, the passwords that open the, the safes uh, with him. The verifier can just pick one of the edges and send to the prover. And uh, so it means that okay, given this edge. The verifier wants to know what's the code uh, that opens the two safes, and the prover just answer back with uh, with the with the correct code. The verifier can open these two safes and check if the two colors are different. And it's not a, uh, okay in cryptography. The safes are called bit commitments, but uh, for the matter of this talk, I'll I'll keep with safes and this physical analogy. And it's not hard to see that. This protocol is complete, so if, if, if the graph contains, uh, accepts that you're coloring and the prover is honest, then he can convince the verifier that the, the, that the graph is actually a three colorable, so the verifier will always check, uh, see two different colors. The protocol is also sound because if the, once the prover committed to, to the colors, with priority one over the number of edges, the verifier asks to, to open two safes that contain the same color. Because there is no, not such a coloring where, where every safe contains different colors uh, connected by edges. And finally, this, intuitively, the, this protocol is zero knowledge. Because every time that the verifier opens two safes, if the graph contains a three coloring, the two colors that, that the verifier sees are different. And they are randomly, in, there are two random different colors because the verifier, the prover, if you recall, the prover 
permuted the colors uh, at first place. Okay, so uh, just, uh, just to, to summarize, the verifier, at the end of the protocol, the only information that the verifier is that, okay, you have two colors that I open to save with two colors that are different, and this could be computed by herself. Oh, uh, okay, that's a good question. So the, you, you can assume that the bit commitment somehow it restricts, so somehow the, uh, you can have a restriction what can be put in a safe. Okay, and then, yeah, okay, physically, okay, when you have safes, this is not true, but uh, with bit commitment you can have this type of restriction. Okay? And uh, so let, let me try to explain what, what's known about zero knowledge in the classical setting. So in the 80s, uh, Benoit et al, they showed that everything that can be proved with multi-provers, multiple provers, can actually be proved in a zero-knowledge way. And this, uh, this beautiful result has, uh, has, had a, a, uh, has been crucial to the development of zero-knowledge in classical cryptography. Later on, it has been shown that if 1A functions exist, and this is one of the basic uh, cryptography cryptographic primitives, then actually everything that can be proved in zero knowledge, uh, sorry, everything that can be proved in interactive systems can be proved in computational zero knowledge. And finally, more important, for uh, when you consider just zero knowledge protocols for NP, there are even protocols where there is a single message from the prover to the verifier uh, that convinces the verifier that it has sound as uh, completed and, and also zero knowledge. And, okay, usually here you also have some extra resources, but, uh, you know, I won't get into the details in this talk. And such zero knowledge for NP, they, they, they are very important in cryptography to, in, in different settings as secure multiparty computation and so on. Uh, uh, okay, if you talk about just computation, everything can be done in two rounds, uh, two provers, one round. Even for zero knowledge. And this is because of the PCP theorem. So, like, it's not about efficiency, it's just about the computability, and then you can assume two rounds, uh, two provers, one round, in both cases. So I have an example. Oh, um, this okay. W one line of research is making so that there the, there are some uh, uh, some protocols where they somehow remove the interaction of uh, of inter of interactive zero knowledge protocols for NP by using this kind of random oracle. So the the prover can pick the question that the verifier would do by herself. Or what what do by by doing queries to random oracles. So the idea is that the prover, with these extra resources, the prover can simulate what the question would be from the verifier. Uh, so there, there are some types of protocol that, uh, that you have the verifier, you have the prover. The prover commits to something, the verifier sends some challenge, and the prover answer by answers the challenge. So there are some techniques that the prover could pick this challenge by, by himself in a verifiable way. And, and then you can remove interaction from here. Okay? If they share what's called the random oracle. Sorry? What, what do you mean by the proof? Oh, no, no, no. And then everything, then you can, you can replace this by a single message here, okay? But, okay, I'm giving the seminar here because we're interested in quantum part of it. As, an, as good quantum complexity theorists, we like to put quantum on every possible concept, so we can... Uh, uh, define quantum proof systems, and uh, the quantum analog of NP is called QMA, 
So in this case, we have a quantum verification algorithm with a quantum proof. So we, want, we have a, this unbounded prover, cook a, cooks up some, some quantum proof and sends to this quantum verifier. And again, we want for true statements, there exists a quantum proof that makes this verification algorithm to accept. And for uh, false statements, no matter which quantum state this proof sends, this verifier should reject with high probability. We can also consider the multi, uh, multiple, like the, the interactive case, and uh, even the non-interactive case, and let, let me uh, describe this in more details. So we have a quantum verifier that interacts with two provers that now can share some entangled state in an offline phase. And then when the game starts, this verifier talks to both provers. And again, we want that for yes instances, there is a st quantum strategy for the provers that makes the verifier to accept and for no ones and so on. And what's interesting about this, about this, um, about this uh, model is that what Reichert, Unger, and Brazilian, they showed is that we can actually make this verifier classical. And in this, this class called MIP star, by adding extra provers that I just didn't put here. But then this classical prover talks to entangled, uh, sorry, this classical verifier talks to entangled provers that do not communicate. And this is the same setting of uh, bell, game, like bell inequalities and non-local games. Okay, so, so this model has tight connections with non-locality. And it has been shown that, for instance, uh, when, when you have in the one prover case, um, this actually, quantum does not actually improve the power of, the mod, uh, of this model, but as a spoiler to tomorrow, it has been shown that uh, MIP star actually is strictly more powerful than MIP when they just have classical correlation. And once I have defined quantum proofs, you can ask, okay, can you have, what, what does quantum geology mean? So, in the single prover scenario, we can still, we still want that the verifier does not learn something from this, from, from this interaction. And again, we are paranoid, so we can assume that this quantum verifier can, uh, does not follow the protocol to learn as much as she, as she wants. And then output some quantum state row. That's her output from the interaction. It could be an arbitrary quantum state. And what we want here is, is to have a polynomial time quantum simulator. Um, that, uh, uh, that, that might depend on this verifier that outputs some quantum state sigma. And zero knowledge here says that uh, the output, uh, so for every, uh, for every verifier, there is a simulator such that their outputs are indistinguishable. And again, we can have these three levels where quantum perfect zero knowledge means that these qu two quantum states are exactly the same. Quantum statistical zero knowledge says that these quantum states are close, are negligibly close in trace distance. And finally, okay, for computational zero knowledge, it means that no, no uh, all quantum poly, uh, polynomial time algorithms can distinguish if, if they have uh, uh, the, the output of the original protocol or the output of the simulator. Okay, this is just a standard uh, extension from from the uh, from the classical from the classical game. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, uh, for zero knowledge, we, we only, uh, we want to be safe against malicious verifiers. So the, the prover wants to hide, the honest prover wants to hide uh, his information. Ah, no, 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 yeah, uh, we, no, yeah, because then it could be an arbitrary thing. No, no, we want just for, so prover is following the protocol and, ha and it's just for a yes instance. So we want to protect the secret that the prover has. So what's known uh, about zero knowledge in the quantum setting? And actually the first question is even, are classical zero knowledge protocols also quantum zero knowledge? And uh, it's not clear, it was not clear in, uh, a priori because we're giving more power to cheating, uh, to, to, the, to the cheating part, right? The malicious, uh, the malicious verifier could somehow do queries in superposition and tr to try to learn more from this, from this poor classical prover. And um, and technically, the the the, the question that why why this is true because classical simulators usually they need to rewind, but quantumly rewinding is not always possible if you do measurements. 
but Walters in uh, like in ter more or less ten years ago showed that sometimes quantum rewinding is possible. But luckily, uh, with this quantum rewinding technique, he can show that uh, this classical genealogy for for three coloring or for for uh, for this IP protocol, for instance, they are also safe against quantum malicious verifiers. So, given that, we can also we can lift this uh, this P space uh, this IP versus classical zero knowledge uh, to P space and quantum zero knowledge by using quantum safe one functions. And in particular, this shows that every problem in QMA has a quantum zero knowledge protocol. But this is uh, when you look to the classical setting, that, that's not the type of zero knowledge protocols that we want. Because usually what you want uh, in a zero knowledge protocol for NP is that someone else, a third party, gives the, the, gives the prover the correct assignment, so gives the, the witness to the prover, and after that, this prover is efficient. And uh, in this proof, you have to go through the inclusion of QMA in this complexity class, class called PP, and somehow all this structure, structure of quantum proofs is, is lost here. So uh, uh, in this protocol, even though uh, the prover could be given the witness, this prover needs to be expon uh, run exponential time computation. Uh, in order to solve this issue, Broadband et al. they showed a protocol where a quantum zero knowledge protocol where the, the in the honest case the prover is given some quantum state and uh, uh, that is supposed to be the, the proof of your the quantum proof for the statement and once this is done once this uh, first phase is done the prover only runs polynomial time computation. The, uh, the problem is this protocol is somewhat complicated. It's not as simple as the, as the coloring protocol that I, for instance, that I presented here. And it has multiple rounds of communication. And this is one of the issues that we're trying to solve in one of the, one of the results that I'll, I'll, I'll just mention. So let me briefly summarize um, like these recent advances that, I, that are on the title. So with, in this work with, uh, with Lofstra and Henry Yuan, we show that the, all the problems that can be solved with entangled provers can be also be solved with entangled provers and perfect zero knowledge. And you can see this as a quantization of this result of Ben R et al. So, um, and uh, in order to prove this, so in particular, this shows that uh, everything that can be solved in non deterministic double exponential time can be solved in perfect zero knowledge, uh, MIP star. And the main uh, technical tool that allows us, allows us to to have the, to achieve the, such a result is uh, is called is what we call locally simulatable codes, and uh, it might be of independent risk interest. And uh, with with broadband, we actually explore these objects even further, and have a lot of applications in cryptography. So, for instance, we have a very simple zero knowledge protocol uh, for QMA. And it turns out to be a proof of knowledge, and I'll define later what a proof of knowledge is. We have other, we, we can improve uh, the, these results a little bit by, by having statistical zero knowledge but arguments, or having non statistical zero knowledge for QMA in some parameters. But uh, uh, yeah, I'll, 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 I won't discuss the, uh, these further results. But also, interestingly, we also show that these locally simul simulatable codes are useful in complexity theory. So we show that uh, the problem of consistency of local density matrices is also Q, uh, QMA harder than cap reductions. And uh, Ikai, he, he proved that it was uh, QMA hard under true reductions. And since then, it has been an open problem. And based on that, we, we define what we call locally simulatable proofs that somehow uh, Inherits the, the, the good features of uh, this, this problem and local Hamiltonian problems, and I'll discuss this in a little bit. So, in this talk, I'll, okay, I'll focus on three. Okay, I'll try to, to explain three of these uh, contributions, and I'll start by explaining this zero, this simple zero knowledge for QMA.
So to start talking uh, about, uh, let's try to devise a zero knowledge protocol for QA. And when you're trying to, to do it, we could do it by looking to a complete problem for it. So let, let's look to this problem called the local Hamiltonian problem. And the input here is uh, m, Hamiltonian, uh, uh, m Hamiltonians that act on at most k out of an n qubit system. And we want to know if there is some state that has low energy. So if, if, if the energy of the, such state uh, is below some threshold alpha m, or for all states, uh, all, or if all states have a high energy according to this Hamiltonian. So are, is everyone familiar with Hamiltonian complexity and such objects? Okay, yeah, it's very different from the talk I gave uh, one month later. <laughs> um, and what Kitab showed in 99 is actually this problem is EQMA complete. So it means that, uh, okay, first this problem is in QMA and it's not hard to see because this low energy state can be seen as a proof and then you can just estimate the energy of this, of, of this quantum state. And the more important part, he showed that, that this problem is QMA complete. And he shows that every problem can be reduced to, to, to do local Hamiltonian problems for some, for a certain part of the state. And one good part of this inclusion in QMA is that the verification is local. So given the, the state has, that has low energy, you can just pick one of the terms at random, and then you just look to k bits out of your quantum state. So we can try to have a zero knowledge protocol for QMA as follows. The verifier and the prover, they know they have, a, they have this instance to the local Hamiltonian problem. And since the prover is very powerful, the prover can cook up some state that is supposed to have low energy to this Hamiltonian. The prover then can just hide the state by one time padding it, so apply random Pauli's to, to each qubit, and then keeps this, uh, keep aside what are the Pauli's that he applied to, to the qubits, and put them on a safe. And then send everything to the verifier, again by keeping the, the codes that open the safe. The verifier can say, okay, I want to, to check the energy of the ith, um, uh, ith term of my Hamiltonian, and then the prover can just send, okay, here are the codes for the corresponding safes, for, for the safes that open the one-time pad key for those qubits. The verifier just opened the, those corresponding safes, and with that, the verifier could just check, um, check, uh, uh, check the, the energy of the corresponding Hamiltonian, right? Because then uh, these density matrices will be on the clear. And this problem is complete and sound, but again, it's far from being zero knowledge because uh, there's no reason why this reduced density matrix is not giving any information to the verifier. So the verifier could not have, a, a priori, the verifier could not have this dense, uh, compute this density matrix by herself. So a second attempt is uh, using this problem defined by Kai, uh, that's the consistence of local density matrices. And this problem is the following. You're given m parts of a quantum state. So you have a, you're supposed to have an n qubit system, uh, a, a state on n qubits. But you're given just reduced density matrix on at most k qubits. And the question is, is there a global state that is consistent with, uh, with all these local parts? So is there a, a global quantum state? So given the, these reduced density matrix rho one up to rho m, is there some quantum state tau such that when you look to the to the corresponding qubits, this quantum state is is, uh, is consistent with these local density matrices, or for all quantum states, uh, there exists at least one one reduced reduced density matrix that is far apart from from this um, from the reduced state of uh, of, of the state tau. And what Ikai showed is that uh, this problem is uh, in QMA, and uh, that uh, the, this problem is QMA hard under two reduction. So if you can solve this problem efficiently, then you can solve uh, the local Hamiltonian problem, but uh, you, you have to also solve the negation of this problem. So you have to show that uh, for every, uh, you have to show that the, uh, Qubit, the, the, you have to also be able to decide if the, uh, for all states, they are far from this uh, reduced, uh, um, 
reduce the symmetry. And what to show with uh, and broadband is that this problem is QME hard under the standard carpet reduction. So we can map uh, yes instance of uh, any problem in QMA to a yes instance of this problem. And we can map all no, uh, no instances of uh, this problem in QMA to no instances of this consistent local density matrices problem. And we could ask, there a second attempt would be, okay, let's use this, now, now, now that you have that this problem is QMA hard under carpet reductions, we can just uh, run the same sort of protocol that I just said for local density matrices, and it would work out. But one, one, one thing that's not so, uh, that's not ideal from this containment of consistence of local density matrices in QMA is that you need multiple copies of the state tau. And the idea is that how do you check if tau is really consistent with uh, these local density matrices? You receive a lot of copies, and morally, you, what you do is do tomography. So you, you for, for with these multiple copies, you measure what is supposed to be consistent with rho y, and somehow you can learn what the density matrix of tau is, and then you compare with rho y. So you want to avoid having multiple copies of the state tau. And we know that from, from the local Hamiltonian problem, is somehow possible, because in the local, on the other hand, in the local Hamiltonian problem, we just need one copy of your, your, your ground state, right? You don't need to have multiple copies in order to, okay, to have some gap between yes and no instances. So in order to have this best of the two worlds, we define what we call the, these locally simulatable proofs. And uh, the idea here is that we have one way, so the idea is that we, we define this complex class, such that for every yes instance, we want that there exists some local projector, so there is a way of testing if your quantum proof is a good proof or a bad proof in a local way. And on top of that, this proof is simulatable. So what we mean by that is that uh, this proof that convinces, that there is a proof that convinces the verifier such that you can compute the reduced symmetry of every uh, set of at most k qubits of this proof um, without knowing psi. So yeah, l l l let me try it again. So when we're talking about proof systems, we want about uh, we're talking about completeness and soundness. And we, what we want to do it is in a local way. So we define these local projectors, pi one up to pi m. And we want that for yes instances, there are these some state psi, such that uh, this state projects them to pi c with high probability. And for no instances, they cannot project onto all pi c's um, at the same time. Okay, and on top of that, what we require is that this quantum state, that uh, for yes instance, this quantum state that passes this test, um, we can compute the reduced density matrix independently of, uh, like without, uh, in, in polynomial time, without having access to this quantum state. And having such a, such an object, it's not hard to see that. Uh, oh, and with broadband, we show that this actually QMA is equal to this simulatable QMA. And with this characterization, it's not hard to see uh, a very simple geonology proof for QMA. So we can assume that the verifier has access to these local projectors. The prover has some quantum state that's supposed to pass this quantum, uh, all these tests uh, with high probability. And again, this prover can just one-time pad this state and send and put the one-time pad keys on some safes and send this one-time pad key on all the safes to the verifier. The verifier can ask, okay, I'm checking this this uh, local state, uh, this local projector pi i. The, very, the prover again open the safes only for the corresponding qubits, and the verifier can then apply this projector pi i. Okay. These one are the definition. Uh huh. Then uh, the point is, oh, 
Oh, the, the point is k is not constant there. Oh, yeah, sorry, sorry, Chip. Um, sorry. These projectors, this P of Vms, actually, they should be local. They should act on at most k qubits. When you're talking about this, this verification algorithm there, you have to have polynomially many, polynomially many uh, copies in order to have a good, uh, I, to have a good uh, gap between yes and no instances, right? To to do a good, yeah, yeah. In the honest case, is tau tensor some some number of that. So so the idea here is that this pro this protocol is complete because if there is, if, if psi is indeed a state that passes the, the test with high probability, if the prover behaves honestly all the way long, the verifier will always, the, the projection of the verifier here, you always accept, like with uh, up to negligible error. If for all quantum states psi, they don't pass this test with high probability, it means that but, but since the prover committed to the to the safe, to, to, to committed to the to this one time pass key, it means that he cannot change his mind. And in this case, whenever he opens these safes, the verifier should at some point with some inverse polynomial probability, the verifier should uh, uh, the verifier should reject. And finally, it is zero knowledge because of this simulatability property because whenever the prover opens a few qubits of this uh, of this uh, opens the one time pad key for a few qubits of this quantum state by the simulatability property the verifier is not learning anything because the verifier already knew what the reduced density matrix there was right so if the verifier knows in advance what 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 she should see then, then somehow she's not learning anything. And this is just an intuition why this protocol should be zero knowledge, but uh, again, to prove zero knowledge, you have to, to show a simulator that, uh, that, could ma that, that matches the output of, any, of an arbitrary malicious verifier. Not K, L, yeah. Okay. I, I don't know, this, this, protocol, no, this protocol works. No, 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 okay, the point is, this is a generalization of both uh, that is that this will be a generalization of both Hamiltonian uh, local Hamiltonians and consists of the local density matrices. Okay, so the idea is that it should have the good parts of both. So, in the consistence of local density matrices, we knew, in some in some sense, we knew how to simulate these quantum states, right? Because they are just the input to your problem. In consistence of local density matrices, you're given the, you you're given this, so you can see them as a simulation of your quantum proof, in some sense. Okay, but on the other hand, like yeah, this, this verification is somehow more like is doing tomography on the on these copies of tau. So that that's the type of thing that we want, want a more direct way of doing that. But but the zero knowledge for this problem would work. Uh, this interactive protocol for the zero knowledge would work uh, as it is. We just want uh, some way of abstracting everything under some uh, a different label. Okay. Yeah. Uh huh. Uh, the techniques are the same. The point is, yeah. Yeah, the, the proof of this is actually showing that uh, the proof there is simulatable. Well, the, the proof of this is show is somehow use uh, it goes through the same type of arguments of the QMA hardness of local Hamiltonian problem, 
And then from that, we just show how to compute the reduced latency matrices. So this proves this QMA hardness and the simulatability of, of these quantum proofs. So this protocol is in like uh, is that because it's just uh, this uh, the prover commits to something the verifier gives a random challenge and the verifier and the prover just opens something so it's a, just a true message protocol in a very simple structure. But in cryptography, um, okay, we, we have the interact through system. They have the, these two properties, completeness and soundness. And completeness says that there exists a good strategy for yes instances, roughly. And soundness that there is no good strategy for no instances. But this is not telling anything about what the strategy should be. Like, for instance, if, if you're talking about uh, zero knowledge protocols for, for, for NP, Completeness is not telling the prover should have uh, so the, the correct witness to this, to, to, to this input. Like the prover um, could, could, pass this, uh, could pass this protocol in an arbitrary way. And for, for some applications for cryptography, we don't want to do that. So for instance, if you want to, uh, you're logging into a system. So of course, uh, if you have a, uh, there is a password that to get into the, into the system. But you want that the only person who can get into the system contains the uh, knows the password, right? So that, 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 that's what uh, uh, these credential systems uh, they require. And for that, in cryptography, we define what a, what a proof of knowledge is. And the idea is that you we strengthen this notion of soundness, and you say that the prover passes the, this, uh, the protocol with, uh, in, in proof of knowledge. We require that the, the prover passes with high probability, then the prover actually knows some NP witness. And how do we define that? It's defining some uh, object called the extractor. And this extractor is just a, um, um, is a thought experiment that it has Oracle access to this prover that makes the verifier accept with high probability. And this extractor can run run this prover and run it backwards so so it, it has access it, this, this extractor is allowed to ask multiple questions to this prover what's not allowed in the original protocol and we want that if this prover passes with high probability then actually this extractor can output uh, a good witness for for this NP problem so in particular this shows that morally the prover had a witness somehow because by interacting by, by, uh, with this extractor, interacting with this prover, he could find such a witness. And in our result, we first we define what a proof of quantum knowledge is. And it's not as straightforward as one would think because NP has a lot of properties that are really nice that uh, do not happen in QMA. So for instance, NP has perfect completeness. Everything that can be proven can be proven with probability one. Perfect soundness, everything that can, cannot be proven. Uh, so the verifier never output yes for a no instance. And in particular, classical proofs are clonable. You can copy it and run it multiple times. And quantumly, this is not the case. So, but again, th this has the same, uh, same flavor that if the prover uh, this definition, we want to, to, to formalize this notion that if the prover passes with high probability, then this prover knows some QNMA witness. So in particular, it knows the, uh, some ground state with low energy, for instance. No, 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 it is something like this, but there are a lot of caveats that you have, one has to, has, to, has to define. Because also, uh, the idea is that here we have some probability of, like we have this threshold probability, and the point is the prover could be using some some witness that's not good enough. It's just good to pass with this probability, but it's not some some witness that would pass with probability one. And then there, there's this notion of what's the quality of the witness that you that 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 you should output here. And uh, and uh, with and broadband then. 
we show that we, okay, we work uh, work out this definition, and you prove that our zero knowledge protocol, that the zero knowledge protocol that I just uh, showed, is also a proof of quantum knowledge. And just a uh, disclaimer: this is uh, that there is some like the, the, the definition uh, was made. Um, um, there, there's a different uh, group of people working on the same problem at Caltech uh, by Coladangelo, Vidic, and Jung, and we worked out this definition together. Um, yeah, I think that's all I have to say about uh, for quantum knowledge, and if you want more details, uh, we, uh, I'm happy to discuss this off offline. So I'd like to give an over, oh, I don't know how much time do I have? Okay. I'd like to give an overview of how we prove uh, of the, the technical tools of, uh, that allow us to prove uh, all of these results. And this tool is called simulatable codes. And I want to define, I won't define these codes like uh, formally, but I'll, I'll give a flavor of, uh, of, their, uh, of its properties. So for instance, let's look at the steam code. And uh, as you should know, like, uh, the sim code is, is the error correcting code that maps zero to this big state, one to this big state. So, and but let's look to to but let's assume that you have some one qubit state psi and look to this encoding of this state psi. If you just restrict ourselves to two qubits of this of this code word, no matter which what quantum state psi is, and no matter what two qubits you look at, the reduced density matrix is always the totally mixed state. Okay, this is uh, this is just by calculation of uh, by the definition of these thin codes. So, in particular, there is a very efficient algorithm that uh, that outputs the reduced density matrix on two qubits of any code word, and this algorithm just outputs identity. Right, so. So there is a very efficient way of outputting uh, reduced density matrix on two qubits of code words of, of uh, the steam code. But this algorithm fails for three, right? Uh, if you look, for instance, zero and one, you cannot uh, output the reduced density matrix anymore for three qubits without knowing your the encoded qubit. So what we'd like to, to, to show is that for every fixed S, there is a quantum error correcting code, C of S, such that every reduced density matrix of, of, this, uh, of any code word can be efficiently computed just given by the set of qubits that, you, that, that, you, that you're looking at. So, so l l let's go back to the previous example. So we have the steam code. And what we can show is that instead of doing it once, we can repeat this idea and encode every qubit of the steam code Again, with the steam code, and this is called the concatenated steam code. And now, when you look to these three qubits of this quantum state, as you saw before, they, they are not they are not ma uh, maximally mixed, right? Because they, 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 there there is some information that, that uh, about of the encoding of this of this qubit, but we know that this qubit is a totally mixed state. So, it is possible. To compute, because this qubit is a totally mixed state, it's possible to compute the reduced density matrix of these three qubits without knowing psi. So, another way, of, okay, a more general way, if, if you're from, okay, a more general way of saying that is that uh, in, the, in this locally, uh, in, this, in, in this case, these three qubits are in the totally mixed state of some fixed subspace. Okay, it's not the totally mixed state of the whole Hilbert space, but of just a subspace of this uh, two to the three uh, Hilbert space. Uh, then it's easier because then it's just uh, if you have this two and this, for instance, then it's just a totally mixed state, right? Because this is a code word of the same code. So we just look to two qubits here in the totalomic state. If you have here, this is totalomic state. So, exactly, exactly. So given the set of qubits that you want to simulate, then you can find it easily what they reduce, reduce the symmetric state. 
And okay, one one of the consequences that we'll show is that uh, if you pick k large enough, so if you concatenate the schemic code big enough times, then uh, you can you can compute the the redundancy matrix on at most s qubits, where k here is log of s, more or less log of s, up to constant k. A little bit uh, like this. Um, but uh, okay. Quantum error correcting is good. We can store quantum information, but we also like to do computation on encoded data, right? We want to. We also like to to compute in a fault tolerant way. So another thing that we require from our simulatable poles is to simulate not only the code words but computation on it. So for instance, let's consider the scene code and applying Hadamard's. It's well known that if you apply Hadamard on every physical qubit. This is equivalent of applying Hadamard on the logical qubit. So our goal of the simulatable codes is not only simulate the reduced matrix of encoding, but also simulate the reduced matrix on the steps of the computation uh, of transversal group of k. But that's not that's not very hard from the previous step, and the hardness, as usual, always comes from non transversal gates. So it's known that no error correcting code has uh, universal gate set, uh, transversal universal, universal gate set. But we can use gadgets, right? We can use the, the tricks of computation by teleportation by requiring that given uh, some magic state, you can compute uh, like this non-transversal uh, non gate by applying this transversal gadget. And then we can say that's fine. We can just apply. Uh, we can just have the encoding of t, encoding of psi, and then we compute the encoding of t and psi using the previous step. But there is a very um, there, there is this subtle t here that here in, in this gadget we need to uh, measure any particular decode uh, uh, this state that we have here. Luckily, this is a totally mixed state. So then it gets very technical, but then you can also show that uh, for this type of gadgets, we can also compute the reduced matrix of at every step of your computation, even if you have to decode this. Uh, should I talk about the proof of how to show, like how to? Okay. The, okay. The intuitive, okay. Um, how the proof of QMA completeness of local Hamptonian is? Uh, so you assume that there you have a verification circuit that is composed uh, of uh, one or two qubit gates, and you have some initial state that has the quantum proof, the auxiliary qubits, and so on. And the reduction, the reduction to uh, what Kitten have showed is that there is a reduction to some Hamiltonian HV. And in particular, for yes instances, the ground state of the Hamiltonian is what we call the history state. And this is just a superposition of all the time steps of your computation. So for every time t, you apply the first t gates and on, on the initial state and put it in your superposition. Um, and what Kitab showed is that, okay, if the original protocol rejects with high probability, the ground energy of the Hamiltonian is high. And uh, the, okay, this is very good for local verification because you just have the local terms, but uh, again, this is not simulatable because you cannot, for every reduced matrix of this quantum state, you can, uh, it's not possible to compute it. But instead of considering the original state V, we can consider a different circuit V prime that instead of having in it, it considers receiving the encoding of this state. And this gate, uh, and, and this circuit V prime just creates encoding of uh, auxiliary bits and magic states, then performs these, the operations that the gates of V on encoded state, either by applying them transversally or applying magic state or using this magic, uh, like the, these gadgets for which magic states. And at the end of the circuit, this, uh, the, uh, after this point, 
the verifier has the encoding of the output of the computation. And then the verifier could just decode the output and decide to accept or reject. And uh, one nice feature of these, uh, of these, um, of, of the circuit is that at every step, either your qubit is fully encoded or it is on a fixed state. So for instance, before encoding the T magic states, you know exactly what the qubit is. This is a raw T magic state. So what we show in this paper with uh, William and uh, Harry is that uh, when you look to the history state, of this quantum computation, it is simulatable if there are if there are correct encode that you want is also simulatable. Somehow we can leave the simulatability of this uh, of this error correcting code to the simulatability of these history states. And Sound, is, sound doesn't get too bad. And then, with, uh, and then using this sort of arguments with broadband, we show that uh, okay, CLDM is QMA hard, and we show that QMA is equal to QMA. By just considering the reduced the reduce matrices, matrices of these simulatable history states. And uh, I just want to finish with some of the questions. So, okay, we're getting better and better zero knowledge protocols, but uh, what for? So, classically, they're used in a lot of places. Quantumly, not, we don't have a lot of, like, we have some uses to that, but uh, there should be more. And we should start, start thinking about that now that we, we know that these objects are also possible. Like, we're getting better and better. Secondly, one conceptual uh, question is, we know that MIP, like uh, when, the, when two proofers have classical correlations, this can be made zero knowledge. When the proofers have quantum correlations, this can be made zero knowledge. What happens if the proofers have no signaling correlation? Can they also be made zero knowledge by showing that the MIP star with no signaling proofers is equal to proofers zero knowledge MIP star? And finally, I didn't talk much about it, but we, with N, we have some result on non-interactive zero knowledge in a more in a less standard model. And we wonder if there is a non-interactive zero knowledge proof for QMA in, uh, in the CRS model, where there is a random string that's sent to the prover and the verifier. And thank you for your attention. So yeah, it does not, and it's very interesting. Why? Because, uh, okay, at least for me, so I'll leave it to you. So in the field here, usually what happens is that the prover sends some classical message, right? So we'll send some message M, the verifier sends some challenge, and the prover answers with some way. Here, the fiat, in the field Shamir, we, we assume some random oracle, and the prover starts with some message, and given this message, the prover queries the random oracle and finds out what the challenge should be, right? And then, by the properties of the random oracle, we know that the, the prover cannot adapt on the message to pass to pass the, the challenge, right? There, there is some the prover cannot adapt too much on this first message because he doesn't know what the challenge would be. Here, in our case, we have a quantum state as the first message. How, how can you make this prover commit to this quantum state in order to pick the question? Because if he inputs the state to the random arc, whatever it could mean, the prover destroys the state. So what's hard to see is that how, how we pick C. So you start with Psi. How can you pick C that depends on Psi and does not destroy it in order to, to Keep for keep uh, keep going on the protocol. Does that make sense?
you know, but but there it's the original protocol is classical, right? So the idea is to be safe against quantum uh, against quantum adversaries. And here the protocol is not classical, so that that's the main difference between these two worlds. And that, that's why it's not clear that something like this could be done. And I'll be here until Friday, so yeah, just. And if it's if it's empty there and I'm just there, you can just knock and like I'm in in the room just beside Andrea. Okay.